Hello folks and welcome to a lifelong Olympic video. Hey, how you doing? And welcome to Central Park in New York City, New York. And today we're in for a special treat. We will do a full loop of Central Park and you will get to see the entire 6.3 mile paved uh, loop inside of the fabled park. And you can also witness a very special guest today, Kequin Lamb, 2018 Portuguese cross-country skier from the Winter Olympic Games at Pyeongchang, has come to visit New York. And we're gonna do a really, really, really slow, casual ski and spike around the loop and uh, have a little chat with you while we do this. So on the left is Kequin Lamb in the blue, skiing, roller skiing. And on the right is Enrique Cubillo, yours truly, uh, spike boarding. And so in this way, you can see the similarities in both the sports and also um, how they complement each other and how casual uh, spike boarding is and of course how, how well they can train side by side and how well they train um, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a biathlon sport or together if you want to practice one and the other. Um, I certainly practice uh, roller skiing as well as spike boarding and I'm here to tell you that after uh, three or four hours roller skiing if you want to go cool down and you want to do your body a favor, you go spike boarding and in about 30, 40 minutes, your body will thank you because you will not even feel all of that roller ski workout. Um, that's how, how well spike boarding um, uh, will actively rest you at a nice slow speed. Um, and of course, both athletes are using shafts and, and the shafts are powering to the rear so it is impossible to ski with forward catch so physiologically it's absolutely impossible uh, to reach forward um, with your vector line and have it produce any significant amount of power so many people make the mistake when they see spike boarding uh, to imagine that in some way shape or form uh, the individual is paddling and especially right now, as you see this stroke, which is a, um, a kick and a spike at the same time, uh, which is actually connecting with a stand-up spike stroke there at that moment. But right there, where it's kicking and spiking, kicking and spiking, believe it or not, people will look at that and say, hey, that's just like paddling. So present to me someplace where uh, people paddle by kicking the water and using vector lines to the rear, and that would be interesting. Uh, so both athletes are also using uh, carbide at the end of their shafts. So the skier would call it a ferrule, and of course the ferrule is a spike, and uh, spike boarding calls it a spike, but it is the same exact two centimeter little piece of carbide that you sharpen with the exact same diamond file or similar every two to three hours of use, and um, that's what propels it. And of course, you can also see how those um, arms are at 90 to 120 degrees. And on the skier, as well as spike boarding, the arms are transmitting power out of the core and the lats and the back and, um, and uh, the glutes and, and the legs. As opposed to using those little tiny muscles to uh, generate lots of power. So, as you can see, both the arms um, on both sets of athletes uh, are, are staying very, very similar, so nearly identical. Of course, the skiing athlete, Kequin Lamb, has straps. He has straps, and uh, when he comes down uh, upon those ski poles connected to the straps, he can exert energy. And of course, the athlete uh, on the right at this moment, um, spike boarding athlete, has a skateboard spike, and few have ever held one in their hand, uh, so few people know exactly what it does. Uh, but once you do hold one, once you do use one, you'll know that it is designed exquisitely well uh, to transfer energy one-handed. 
So get your hands on one and you will understand why that works so incredibly well. And of course, from the handle down, what you've got is a very chunky ski pole. Um, and from the handle up, you have what's known as a skateboard spike. And without that upper handle, it is insanely difficult to uh, perform well with a stand-up spike. And uh, when we get, whoop, there's a little blip. Uh, should have switched with Kequin. He's having to ride that berm there, that little beam of, uh, that little seam of asphalt connection. So, um, roller ski wheels, as many of you know, and some of you might know, you might not know if you don't know roller skiing. The wheels are a little more sensitive uh, to obstruction than the skateboard wheels uh, are. Uh, but as we were saying, the skateboard spike uh, is exquisitely designed to produce a stand-up spike, and a stand-up spike is a slightly modified double pole, uh, which you're really going to see very well side by side as soon as we get over to the North Hill climb. So a lot of folks are looking over, they're having a little event there. That's Engineer's Gate, and by the way, folks, that patch where we passed where that truck was, that was the very first place where the Kubi Cross ever existed. So the very first time that a kick and a spike was exerted um, back on August 10 of 2010 at 6.15 p.m. in the evening. So what we have here and what you're seeing uh, is a skier, of course, uh, and uh, folks, please look into the history of skiing and recognize uh, the innovations that have occurred over the years. For thousands of years, for thousands of years, skiing involved one shaft and two skis. And that is how they skied, with one shaft and two skis. And it wasn't fairly uh, far into the modern era uh, that the um, double poles really began a great deal of use. Uh, it's noted, at least from what I see on uh, internet historical records, that it's in 1700 that the double pole arrives, but way into the modern era, we're talking about black and white photography exists of, um, of skiers in Colorado and Europe, many of them using one shaft. So the double poling um, hasn't been around for all that long, it's fairly, fairly modern, and of course there's been a wide variety of techniques. Uh, and technique modifications to the double pole. And as we all know, the skier on the right hand side now in blue, Kequin Lamb, uh, this individual would not be performing the lower body stroke that he is performing at this very moment, more than likely, if, um, if wise minds would not have prevailed at the birth of skate ski. So sadly, FIS has to live with the fact that they wanted to ban, and there was individuals that wanted to regressively ban and make extinct the skate ski technique. Of course, now we know that is the fastest way in the world to ski, and in effect, you are skating with your lower body. You're skating, you're putting your nose over your knee, and your knee over your toes, and you're bouncing over that center line. And you're skating, there you can see it. He's skating the same as you would be skating on inline skates or speed skates. The same as you would be skating on that board. You're balancing and gliding over a center line. Now, had wiser minds not prevailed, everybody, I assume, would be classic skiing. They would be doing diagonal stride only. And there would be no World Cup racing with skate skiing. That is the sad history that everyone needs to live with. And that to me is a sad state of affairs that people would have denied uh, kinetics that were far superior in performance and it had to fight for three or four years just to exist. It seems completely ridiculous, but that is the case. And what you're seeing now in spike boarding on the left side is you're seeing everything that cross country skiing, especially roller skiing has ever been brought to the single board with a single shaft called a skateboard spike. And by the way, you could Kubi Cross if you so desired. Uh, and right now, as you can see, this bit of a, uh, a scooter drill into a classic kind of kick can be achieved uh, on, on the board. This will help you with your diagonal stride if you want to replicate that. And of course, bang, straight back into a, a scooter type of kick. So a scooter kick and uh, replicating a classic cross-country ski move is very different. 
uh, because uh, right now when you're seeing is that classic cross-country ski move um, and the stroke is pretty short and the knee is not being lifted and kicked that's what you would do on a skateboard and a scooter so the skateboard kick or scooter kick whichever you like to call it um, connected to the Nordic upper body movement Nordic cross-country upper body movement and that's called a kubi cross folks that is called a kubi cross stroke and that's a stand-up spike stroke and we're not going to show the inside kubi cross here um, that stroke actually is when you kick and spike on the same exact side and it's good if you need to carry something and you still want to shift your legs but we'll get that another day mostly primarily uh, spike boarding is stand-up spike and kubi cross uh, one keeps the legs on the deck, stand up spike, and the other engages the legs. We're going to go down this north hill now. This is the steepest end, so we've gone about three miles. Well, we started kind of in the middle of the park. Um, so, done about two, 2.3 miles. We're going to descend. This is the steepest end of the park. We're approximately up at about 106, 107th Street. The park, folks, if you're not from New York, extends from the bottom of 59th Street. And it, it's a square rectangle that goes all the way up to 110th Street. So we're just gonna hang out here in the back and let's speak to the wheel situation a little bit. Uh, Kikwin is on some um, roller ski training wheels. And those of course are black and all of you who ski know them. And they are made to uh, reduce speed and replicate snow conditions. So we're not gonna be flying down this hill setting any speed records. And of course, poor old Kikwin, he's just doing his first lap of this park doesn't know it all that well so um, doesn't know every turn and every nuance and every downhill so on a couple of these downhills on that west side we're going to actually show you how we can use a bicycle uh, to um, scrub a little bit of speed uh, here but as you can see he's skiing very well uh, like any Olympian should and would be roller skiing and um, the two sports, of course, together, side by side, complement themselves quite a bit. Uh, I've, I've spike boarded with uh, quite a few roller skiing athletes. Um, and uh, anybody who wants to come and uh, roller ski in New York, give us a holler. We can talk about your situation and uh, we'll see what kind of gear we might have or might not have for you. But the more people show up, the more industry is going to help and support guys so uh, if you're a college skier if you're an elite skier if you're visiting from Europe um, make that call two or three weeks in advance uh, so we can know where you're coming and who you are and we'll see if we can't get gear we can't get gear for everybody uh, but we'll try to do what we can bring your boots we do have bindings for uh, both uh, NNN and SNS uh, so we just might not have the exact size pole uh, but give us a holler, so we'll see what we can do, and we'll see what kind of available time we have as well. So we're getting ready to go up into the north side. As you can see, the pavement here uh, is very new along this west side. We're at 110th Street, absolutely the very top. If you look over to your left there, that would be uh, 110th, and we're going to start going up this hill. And if I, I've asked Kequin to double pull, and um, you're going to see double pull right next to Stand Up Spike. And you're going to see the similarities. You're also going to see uh, the differences. Um, but as you can see, uh, the vector line propels to the rear. The spikes spike, and the arms remain at 90 degrees. On the skier, we see the uh, uh, pelvis, the hips, remaining at a 90 degree angle to the boards of the skis. And we see compression and straight back down. And in the stand-up spike, the hips have gone to 45 degrees, and there's a leading shoulder and a leading hip, uh, and of course the shaft uh, needs to be as close uh, to 90 degrees to the board as possible. So obviously just like in skiing, the same physics apply. The further out to the side your shafts go, the more power you're going to lose. So you want to keep in skiing those poles uh, parallel to the um, ski boards and you're going to want to keep that skateboard spike completely parallel uh, to that spike board as much as you can. We're we'll going to do a little one arm here and start kicking and uh, Keekwin's going to start doing a little kicking as well and a full body stroke um, into his um, 
skate skiing, and then there's Kubi Cross on the climb. So pay close attention to boards and wheels. There's boards and wheels. So you're looking at three boards um, and eight wheels. So four wheels on each, and they're just slippery boards, folks, and they need to go up hills. So the advent of taking Nordic movement and bringing it to a board had to happen. Just imagine advocating for hands-free skiing. So there is a whole movement out there of athletes. Uh, they don't need to be pointed out. Um, people can figure that out, but they are advocating for hands-free pushing on a board forever. There's a reason why no one ever raced boards up hills at World Cup levels. No one ever dedicated uh, to racing boards up hills because when you kick a board and you can't leverage your upper body and the fall line of the hill or the mountain is coming at you, you're going to have one hell of a dead spot the moment your leg releases and goes into that next stroke. It's going to go push dead spot, push dead spot, push dead spot. And all of you know that who actually uh, do some upper body free uh, climbing. That's a great training modality, but no one's gonna race skiing at World Cup without poles. It's absolutely ridiculous. So if you have a slippery board and you need to take it up hills, well, you're gonna use a Kubi Cross. Of course, you're gonna engage your upper body. So the Kubi Cross needed to be born and um, just slippery boards, people. Um, the skateboard was never used for anything other than radical and um, uh, acrobat and those are beautiful theaters so skiing lives in those theaters very well and here we're gonna catch a little break just push that bike forward as you can see there's a little wheel difference speed uh, we have a uh, 79a durometer urethane on that spike board and um, there's just training gummy black wheels on the skier but even still he's gonna take a little break here so uh, when you don't know your terrain respect the fall lines respect where you're going and of course folks what you're not seeing is the people in front of us so um, if you got a full run out, that's great, but we're in a park uh, with people up front and you just don't know exactly what they may or they may not do. And especially when you don't know your terrain, uh, take it easy and don't be going for it. So we'll take another little speed check here, get back and uh, keep our speed in check so two athletes can stay the same. And now we've descended that north hill. Over here on your right, which is going to be our left, you're going to see the cutoff. So this is the north end cutoff. And had we taken that cutoff, there it is right there, we wouldn't have gone up the hill, um, we wouldn't have come down the hill. So for you guys who don't want to do the North Hill, uh, you'll see it on that east side as you come up. Just take a left, you'll cut through, and you'll probably take a good three quarters of a mile off of your, your ride as well. And for those folks who don't know Central Park, uh, this has all been painted just recently. And the way it breaks down is those double white lines um, to your right. That's a jogger's lane, so don't go in that jogger's lane. And right where the spike boarding athlete right now, that is the slow lane. Um, that is the slow lane for cyclists. And where our keep one is right now is the fast lane for cyclists. Uh, see, there it says slow, slow right there. And the faster cyclists can be further over on your left, which would be keep one's right. And um, there's emergency vehicles that come in very rarely, but you hear them, you hear them, no problem. But stay out of that jogger's lane. And here on the west side, we have super new, perfect pavement. Really nice, it's gonna be so new in fact that it's not even going to be painted yet. And that's gonna look really divine. And that's not the way it always is. So that pavement was, was completely and totally new. Um, and it got painted a few weeks after that, but we got to enjoy it, Keekwin got to enjoy it. Um, and um, there are some folks asking some questions, saying, hey, what are you doing? And we get that constantly, constantly, constantly. And so little is roller ski understood. Uh, I could be roller skiing in New York City every day of the week, and people will say, what are you doing? Did you invent that? What's going on there? And when you tell them it's cross-country skiing, Americans don't know anything about roller skiing, and that's a, that's a crying shame um, because, of course, skiing, is skiing and the more people ski the more people are going to ski and by that i mean the more people are roller roller skiing and the fitter people are the more they're going to alpine ski um, folks there's a terrible statistic it's a sad statistic in alpine skiing and that is that people go alpine skiing and they fall down dead from a heart attack 
and that's because they're not fit. It's the same as going out to shovel snow. So the concept, uh, I need to get snow off my driveway is there. And people forget, well, yeah, well, for you who has been doing nothing or you're terribly out of shape, um, it's, you know, an exertion that is going to kill you. Um, and of course, uh, skiing is the same thing. So especially if you go to altitude. So the minute you go to altitude and you're not fit, well, that's the number one killer of skiers, guys. And here comes a little skateboarder um, zooming down on his... Um, on his uh, trick board and he's gonna pass us here give you an idea how chill out we are this guy's gonna kick on one leg and he has no idea about switch kicking nor does he even have a board that's optimized for switch kicking but uh, he's doing pretty good although he's not leaning into his uh, his glide side but off he went and no helmet at all and goodness knows where he's going but hey at least he's not driving a car right so uh, we continue on, and as we were saying, skiing is skiing. So the more people have skiing on the mind, uh, the more people are going to ski in general, whether they're going to ski mountaineer, whether they're going to Nordic ski or tele ski um, or roller ski. Uh, the idea is to get people skiing and skiing straight out um, uh, their door. So ski whatever is out your door and ski hard, and ski often. Um, and uh, the promotion and the dissemination of outdoor sports and recreation is something we desperately need uh, in this country. We apply that lesson to too few people at too late a stage in the educational system. So if you want to teach people how to speak Mandarin, it's a good idea if you start at age six or even younger. Uh, but if you expect to be able to teach people Mandarin at age 28, well, you know, your outcome is only going to be so successful. So if you're wanting people to ride a bike and pick up groceries, roll over hills, stay active, inline skate, uh, switch kick skateboards, performance scooters, roller ski, uh, flat water stand up paddle, uh, even rock climbing, uh, you don't teach people this stuff early on people have kids they get busy and it's very challenging for them uh, to then pick these things up and then they're stuck with running and they're stuck with a gym and that's where we're at and meanwhile roller skiing is just uh, the sport of gods I mean it is it is probably my biggest regret in all of life to have gotten into cross-country ski late uh, but it is one of the biggest joys of my life to have been able to get introduced to roller ski uh, by first uh, a good six, five, six years of spike boarding. I can't tell you how casual it is and how uh, uh, greatly enhanced the experience of beginning on uh, roller skis if you've already got some upper body and you've got some core. So um, I've only snow skied about two days in my life. Oh, I've classic skied about three days in my life, uh, backcountry sort of uh, bushwhacking, but I've only been on um, skate skis uh, once in my entire life on a groomed trail. That's it, up at Fawnstock State Park, and I absolutely loved it. But that's the kind of access that I have, and many people are exactly the same. Here's the pavement we spoke about. Uh, beautiful, new, there's the Montana in the background. Um, and um, uh, Central Park is very well maintained, super well maintained. So the Conservancy uh, has, a, has a, a mission. Um, and uh, an allowance that they raise for themselves of uh, about three and a half million dollars above and beyond what the Parks Department gives them and the perimeter people uh, who live along the perimeter of this park maintain this park very well and uh, it gets repaved uh, very regularly um, and if they stop the traffic completely that may change but the winters are brutal here so expansion and contraction if you're watching this and you don't know anything about skiing, roller skiing, you're worried about the spikes, uh, worrying the, making the pavement go go sour, uh, think again. So it's it's the it's the beast mode expansion and contraction of the winters um, that that tear apart asphalt uh, pretty well as far as, as 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 well as pardon me compression of driving. So this park does get a bit of driving, folks. This is a I don't know whether this was a Monday or a Tuesday or this is a weekday and that's why this park is, is pretty much empty at this moment um, and probably the middle of the day but on a weekend uh, this park is going to get a great deal more use and there will be many 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 tourists which is always welcome that didn't used to be that many people using the park 20 30 years ago when I first started coming up but now it's, it's still like to see people of all kinds 
um, using the park for all different reasons. Um, and of course, this is the same circuit that the GS Mangioni's on and the Lou Maltese and all of the bicycle races that Century Road Club Association um, and New York State Bicycle uh, uh, Racing uh, do. The races go off at 6, 6.30 in the morning and are done by 8.30 at the latest. Uh, there's a little divot right there. And what we're coming up here on is also a crosswalk. So we're looking at people uh, who are crossing. And of course, the roller skier only has the bicycle to lean into, or they can give a holler and scratch their spikes a little bit, make a little noise. Uh, but we're just going to take it easy here down this descent. Um, but as you can see, you might have seen the spike boarding athlete able with an ability to put down a foot and cadence break. Cadence braking is pretty comfortable. We tiny little bit of foot drag, uh, up up to speeds of 30 miles an hour, no problem. Even 35, 36 miles an hour. It's very challenging for roller skis to stop. Uh, at those speeds, it's challenging for them to maintain uh, those speeds. Um, so spike boarding is very, very, very casual. Um, there's no boots, there's no bindings, but still the engagement is very similar. Um, and if you ever not want to miss work, if you ever want to not miss workouts, um, because the boots, the bindings, the terrain, the people, the whatever, uh, you're only going to commute. I don't miss too many ski workouts because. Spikeboarding is skiing, so uh, it is, uh, mentally speaking, it is 100% skiing. Uh, physiologically speaking, it shares so much uh, that you don't miss that much if you're if you're having a spikeboarding workout. And what I like to do is I actually like to um, roller ski um, in the evenings when there's absolutely no, no one in the park, and I also like to roller ski in a lot of different other areas. Um, that isn't necessarily uh, Central Park, but if you're a tourist and you want to come up and uh, uh, take a couple spins in the park, absolutely, it's one of the best places in the world uh, to be to be to be roller skiing. Um, but if you want total quiet um, and not a lot of distraction, uh, sometimes the park isn't the best place. So we're coming down here uh, towards Tavern on the Green. We're going to do a, a little rise over to our left. I'll let you know when you're going to see. Um, uh, Strawberry Fields, which is where John Lennon lived, and of course the Dakota, that would be the 72nd Street area. And as you see, there's no painted lines on the pavement. And all these people are looking over and wondering, what the heck is going on? Uh, what the heck is happening? Um, and with a spike boarding athlete, you've seen a lot of stroke combinations. You've seen one over one right there where there's no engagement. One over one is a really great way uh, uh, to um, engage one arm and um, practice your balance uh, over your center line very nicely. Uh, those hot dog stands that we just passed back there, that was the ramp off for 72nd Street. And this lump right here over to Keekwin's uh, right and your left, go up that little lump, I'll show you the little entrance, and that would be um, uh, the entrance to Strawberry Fields. And also on the right, you're gonna see the, 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 the um, the lower part of the park has a, a, a cutoff as well, um, so it's kind of like a sandwich loaf with the two ends cut off. It's a long rectangle, so you're going to point those out to you, so you'll know where the cutoffs are as well. Uh, there's a reservoir over there to the right. That's where you rent your boats if you want to go paddling with your loved ones. Um, and there's a little more traffic here on the southern end. We're getting down near the 76th Street area. There you go. That little path right there will take you up to. Um, uh, strawberry fields and there's the cutoff on the right hand side so if you just wanted to not do the lower loop you just take a left right there and you bang you'd be straight back over on the east side so right now we're going up Central Park what coming down Central Park West Central Park West would be just over to where that little um, uh, uh, pedicab uh, went up is going up that hill that'd take you straight up to 72nd Street and the Dakota, we can't really see the Dakota. You saw the Montana there, the top of it. The Dakota would be straight up that little ramp. That would be 72nd Street. We're gonna pass uh, Sheep's Meadow over here on the right-hand side, and then we'll pass Tavern on the Green. It'll be over on the left as soon as we come up over this little, this little summit right here. And um, for years and years and years, there was a little slalom uh, skateboard and uh, inline skate slalom course that ran here. Uh, folks will remember who were in the park in the in the early to mid 80s, late 80s. Uh, there's a lot of slaloming there. That hasn't happened in a long, long, long time. Uh, but the inline skaters still routinely meet here at Tavern on the Green. 
and they have a fantastic club called Empire Skate. And if you want to do some inlining with them, I do some inlining with them um, uh, throughout uh, the year. It's a nice club, uh, very well run, and they've got uh, some speed demons, some of the best skaters in the world. Uh, not a ton of them, um, uh, but there are some very, very fast individuals right there at that curb. Right there is where they meet. Um, I don't know when it is. Just check them out at Empire Skate and uh, you will find them. I used to have a big long train that they had a nice long snake and that's gotten a little smaller. And over to the left is going to be uh, Tavern on the Green. Over to the right is Sheep's Meadow. And so we're descending here and getting ready to take a big loop and around there is Tavern on the Green. You see it a little bit. The only park, the only restaurant inside the park. It's a very formal restaurant. It's gone through a uh, new ownership change recently. I have not eaten there. Um, used to be very nice. Um, I've been there in many, many years. Uh, when you see me slaloming a little bit, I'm just scrubbing a little speed, right? So you slalom, you just scrub a little speed so we can maintain the parallel action with both uh, the spike border and the skier as we come down here and come around. And you're going to get to see a good shot of uh, the skyline along 59th Street, just the classic skyline um, of New York City on the southern end of, of the park. So, um, let's see if we spot any buildings over here on the left that we see. Probably not. The trees are going to block it all out. But those rocks that you see over there, uh, those rocks, those ancient rock formations, that's what allows uh, Manhattan to become Manhattan. Those great big, just massive stones that the island has. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been able to have built all these skyscrapers that existed. So it's a tiny little island. It's only, um, you know, a couple miles wide. And uh, um, it's about, uh, about 8, 12 miles long. Uh, so, you know, when you're doing stuff on the street, what's interesting is uh, you end up seeing everybody. Uh, so if you're a park person and you're, you've been racing bikes in here, you've been skating in a line, goodness knows how many laps I've done of this park, uh, thousands and thousands. Um, you get to know everyone, you see everyone. Uh, there's actually uh, the Time Life, uh, Time Warner Tower was back there on the left, that twin tower, uh, black twin tower. You notice that Trump Tower, Trump Plaza Tower, is that black building right there, straight above Keaton's head. You might see it a little bit. And that would be the corner that would have been Columbus Circle back there. Um, and now we're passing the 7th Avenue entrance. If we went up that little ramp right there, we'd pop out right at 59th Street and shoot down 7th Avenue. And this is the slimmest part of the park. So a lot of people, when they're newbies, they're out here doing intervals. You don't want to be doing intervals on anything, whether that's a bike or skates or uh, inline, spike boarding or skis. It's going to thin out really, really narrow here. So there's Time Warner. You can see it doubled up back there. And there we begin to see the skyline of 59th Street. There it all is right there with the pedicab. But do your, do your uh, repeats and your speed work on the north end of the park because you got all the shenanigans down here. And this is just a mellow day um, right now. But on, uh, on a weekend, you would have a lot more pedicabs and, of course, the carriages. Um, which we hope one day will stop for the horses. Um, there's a lot of that activity down here on the north end. It's a little more quiet. Folks, we're winding up towards the end here. We're only going to have one more turn and one more descent. We'll be back at the boathouse area on the east side where we started. And we hope you've been enjoying this. And um, I don't know how many slow, super slow laps there are out there. Uh, especially with an Olympic skier and spike porter. Um, but we decided to publish this entire loop so that you could see Central Park. Uh, it's just not too many. There's a lot of CRCA races out there. If you want to see guys and gals racing CRCA, just look up Century Road Club Association um, uh, park races, and you'll see cameras mounted on the front and back of, of, of uh, race bikes. Um, but then you don't get too much of a feel for what the loop is really like at a slower, more uh, more modest, more modest speed. There comes a couple cars on the south end. There's usually a little more cars. They have some exits and whatnot where they can go to. That's a limo driving through, sort of pushing the pace. It's probably gonna just end up at a stoplight anyway. Um, but I got a feeling they, they might not even be able to be in here or shouldn't be in here at this time. I'm not quite sure. Um, so as you can see, it, it did get a little thinner down there. 
And so now we're headed north. Those skyscrapers there are 59th Street. And now we're back on the east side. So the Plaza Hotel would just be straight over there to the left, right near where that white and black uh, skyscraper is, that rectangular uh, building. And um, we're just gonna go down this little hill and, and we'll be done. So folks, if you have any questions at all about spike boarding, uh, please uh, email us, get a hold of us at coach at lifelongolympic.com. And um, if you're a elite skier, if you're a college skier, uh, if you are a um, retired uh, Euro pro, if you're a retired American pro, if you're an American pro, uh, look us up, come to New York and um, ski with us and let's make some media uh, in Central Park and in and around everywhere where we know how to ski. And if you can come two or three at a time, that'll really be nice and we can really begin to demonstrate uh, roller skiing um, uh, to these United States and uh, let them know as well uh, that the competition is fun, but the lifelong aspect of practicing the sport uh, is even more gratifying. Very few people know uh, that uh, Olympic uh, female athletes have done what men have never done. I've spoken to a great many people and if they did know that we won a gold medal, they don't have the slightest idea that men, Olympic men, have never done that. That news was, was, not, was not put out there and they had no idea that, uh, that roller skiing is, is the foundation of, of much of the year for these athletes. So a great many Americans would, I know, would be open uh, to roller skiing if we begin to create the new American roller skier, the new American skier, um, and people begin to understand strength, endurance, and balance. You see me drag a spike a little bit. That just gives some people some heads up uh, that we're coming through. Um, and of course that can be done with ski poles as well, no problem. But yeah, um, roller skiing, spike boarding can, can cross train so well for the field sport coach. And if we can let the field sport coach know that, and that we don't want to take their athletes away from them, we just want to cross train them with spike boarding and or roller skiing, and or both, um, we're going to get uh, a, nice, a nice result, guys. So as New York, so goes the country. Um, and as New York, so does uh, activity get observed, observed, and it's easily pressed out because New York has such significance. So we're coming up uh, to the end here. The uh, boathouse will be on the right. So I bid you farewell. Thanks for tuning in. And lifelong Olympic, ski hard, ski often, spike hard, spike often, spike boarding. And folks, we'll see you at the next one. Check out our other videos of Kikwin Lamb skiing all over the metro area.